Under our general subject this evening, we must pause for a moment and consider a few phases of social anthropology. We are thinking in terms of the adjustment of the individual uh, to the society of his time and his integration on a social level. Perhaps we should try to investigate a little more closely the basic relationship between a person and his society. By society today we mean essentially a culture level or a culture pattern. A situation which constitutes an immediate environment to the person throughout the years of his life and which certainly does bear an important part in the formation of his character. And, uh, social anthropologists have approached this problem in several ways. First, to determine the duty of the person to his culture. And to answer the pressing problem, what do we gain by adjustment? What are we integrating the individual into? What is the essential value of his being adjusted to a situation or a condition which in many ways he basically resents and into a social structure which in many respects does not satisfy his cultural instincts? Our anthropologists point out that there are at least three major ways of looking at the relationship of society to the individual. The first concept is that society or the social growth of mankind is a gradual evolutionary development taking place in various areas and developing independently. In other words, we can now speak of Chinese culture or Greek or Latin culture or Egyptian culture or Hindu culture. These various streams to one school represent the moral experience and experiment of people growing up in areas for the most part comparatively isolated in the earlier periods of formative uh, areas of their growth. To this kind of thinking we can liken the life of the small child that brought up within a certain kind of parental environment may later have to go out to experience a general world situation. But its character and its nature are largely influenced by its early environmental pressures. Cultures as we know them today are mostly at an advanced state, but in their developments and in their origins they arose in isolated regions and were comparatively distinct before they began to merge or mingle with each other. On this assumption, some groups feel that there is no essential need to assume that there is a basic or inevitable culture. That there is no reason to assume that culture is one process unfolding through countless races and almost unimaginable eras of time. The second group follows what has been termed the diffusion theory. This is substantially the belief that culture is one essential growth. That by diffusion it means simply that culture in various periods, perhaps prehistoric, was distributed from some hypothetical center 
and that this cultural development is therefore the development or unfoldment of one theory, one concept, one essential program, modified by the areas in which it is at various times separated or even isolated. But actually, the culture is a term for the essential process of social growth, and that this process is essentially the same everywhere, that there is only one culture, but that this culture manifests in varying degrees according to the platforms of social achievement attained by different peoples. There is now a third point of view which is largely psychological, but which is also uh, shared among several groups of scientists in different areas, and this is that culture is essentially a production of man's own personal consciousness, that culture is merely a moving into manifestation of the person himself. The culture is therefore mysteriously and continuously contemporary, and the apparent descent of it by an evolutionary formula is merely due to that peculiar relationship which causes human beings to proceed from one area or level of thinking or feeling to another. Therefore, culture or society is actually the immediate complex of peoples at various stages in their own development, and that therefore there is very little difference between culture and fashion. That fashions are tremendous forces moving through human consciousness of short duration and not essentially to be regarded as reasonable other than perhaps as some form of psychic symbolism. This group will go so far as to assume that the society we live in, create or form, is a psychic symbol of our own pressures, our own neurotic trends and tendencies, and the peculiar restrictions or limitations of our own understanding. I think we should consider all three of these because uh, the modern thinker confronted with several evils always chooses all of them in order that he may uh, perhaps confound his own mind but also lest he leave out something which he may later need. Uh, these processes, like so many other basic issues of human life, still defy a clear and certain analysis. They are still largely in a theoretical state or condition, because until we do solve man, we will never probably be able to find the ultimate answer to any question bearing upon man's life. But we do have certain relative information. On the theory that we first stated of the independent rise of cultures, we do understand how cultures in uh, actual racial or religious groups may remain comparatively separate, and that as long as the people do not mingle with their neighbors or the stranger beyond their gates, that they have a comparatively homogeneous culture. Therefore, that their culture patterns are simpler, their cultural directives are more clear, their cultural purposes are more immediately understood by each member of the group. If, however, a number of different cultures meet within an area or a location and produce what we might term a heterogeneous culture, uh, then we have conflict between the essential patterns by which individuals attempt to create a social life. The heterogeneous culture is perhaps as well illustrated in our own country as anywhere else in the world. We have very few roots 
in the ancient traditional forms. Yet we have gathered here peoples from many different cultural patterns. These peoples have to a measure perpetuated their own cultures among uh, strangers as well as their own. And today we have what someone has tried to distinguish as an American culture. Just exactly what this is, we are not sure. But it seems to mean the American way of life, the American way of doing things. It is a way which seemingly is quite different from that of other peoples. But the question arises as to whether or not it is a chemical compound formed from other cultures which have contributed uh, their various degrees of influence to our way of life. There seems to be some evidence for this in our attitudes toward cultural artifacts or to the things which cultures produce. Our home furnishings, our architecture, even the clothing that we wear, all these show distinct influences of compound cultures. We are still tremendously influenced by French clothing designers. We have derived our architecture from nearly everywhere, and the various borrowings become strata, resulting in almost constant architectural change and the outmoding of things, which not long ago were considered stylish, and the reverse process, the coming back into mode of things regarded as decadent but a short time ago. As we look about us, we see the tremendous amount of cultural borrowing. We find it also in language, where we discover the many different lingual groups that have contributed to the wealth of our vocabulary. We see it in a measure in our educational systems, which blend the findings of many different uh, schools and periods of educational concepts. Thus, there seems to be some ground for assuming that we have a polyglot culture, a culture that has arisen from the heterogeneity of our way of life, its comparative youthfulness, and yet at the same time the extraordinary development and precocity which it exhibits. As to the second theory, considering culture to be merely a diffusion from some X point no longer obvious. It seems that there are some defenses for this point of view also, but they are not as strong as those which we have mentioned for the first point of view. On the basis of the diffusion concept, we do recognize that many of our ways of life do represent a moving in of other cultures, as we have previously noted, but that also this diffusion concept should assume that somewhere there is a root of our own peculiar kind of culture, that we are moving according to, it, to, according to a definite pattern and plan. The evolution of culture, for example, might support the idea of cultural diffusion. If culture is an inevitable pattern unfolding through time, moving from within itself rather than from external factors, then the evolution or diffusion of cultural process may be accepted. Uh, this is still, however, more theoretical than the evidences of borrowing which we have previously mentioned. The third position also comes into our daily life. To what degree is the individual himself immediately causing his own culture, here and now. I think we may say there are considerable uh, instances which would support such an idea. The invention of the automobile, for example, certainly produced a major cultural change that could not be explained by the polyglot theory nor by the mere diffusion theory. Here the individual suddenly imposes a major variation upon his way of life. This variation, having certain causation within it, immediately begins to modify 
the basic elements which hold culture together and force these elements into new patterns. Motion picture, television, radio, all these have done the same thing. And now the development of nuclear physics forces an entirely new attitude upon the world. Therefore, there is something definite to be said in favor of the idea that culture is a continuous manifestation of the emergencies of human nature. On these different patterns, then, we must come to some basic idea as to our own relationship with this complicated situation. When we think psychologically of adjusting a person to the society to which he belongs, what are we actually saying? We are actually saying that we wish him to adjust to the prevailing attitudes in religion, politics, law, art, science, education, and all of the different uh, modifying or contributing elements which have created his contemporary a way of life. Now, adjustment in this sense does not investigate or even explore the problem of the integrity of that to which he adjusts. We are to adjust, for instance, to a political concept. We believe in this concept. In many instances, however, we doubt it. In many conditions and situations that arise, we regard it as inadequate. And many individuals resent it. Yet it constitutes a prevailing mode of things. The same is true of the world of arts. We are not in common agreement as to whether modern music is adequate. Yet we are assumed to adjust. Or if we cannot adjust by an enthusiastic acceptance, at least by a grudging acquiescence to whatever the prevailing pattern may be. We are not sure that we approve entirely of the way that medicine is practiced but this is the way it is practiced, should we adjust to it. We are not at all convinced that our educational system is what it should be. Yet we are in, in it and part of it. And the average individual finds no way of personally resisting the pressures of the conditions around him. That which he cannot successfully resist he must therefore contemplate as something perhaps to which he should adjust. So man adjusts to culture mostly today by a negative attitude, one in which he is not satisfied but finds no adequate solution to his own dissatisfaction. In recent years, however, the cultural pattern of our way of life has broken down dramatically and tragically. As we watch from day to day, this cultural pattern loses more and more of its basic integrities. We were once told that this was not true, or that the reason why uh, we thought this way is because we were habit-ridden, and therefore were unable to adjust to progress. That what we call change was really progress in disguise, and that we could not penetrate the disguise because of inadequate attitudes or facilities or because we were crystallized into some previous concept. Today we no longer believe this. We do not believe that all change is progress. We do not believe that it is inevitable that change must be for the better. Nor are we certain that adjustment to change is the solution to problem. The negative attitude that man must adjust to progress has also had some rather unfortunate uh, byproducts. Uh, one of these byproducts has been the rapid loss of human creativity. Uh, the acceptance of something which is not satisfactory does not strengthen the individual's resources. It weakens him more and more and forces him to become ever increasingly dependent upon that which he does not approve. Thus, 
we have observed in recent years especially a continual loss of individual creativity. We are not able to produce solutions. In other words, we are not able to rescue society from its own dilemma. We are merely able to share in the dilemma, and this is not progress. Psychologists take the attitude, and many of them rather practically minded persons, probably have a certain immediate uh, fact to support their opinion, namely that what cannot be cured must be endured, and that therefore adjustment to the situation enables one to endure that situation with less strain, wear, and tear upon his own psychic integration. To a measure this is certainly true. Uh, most of the history of progress, real progress, has shown that the leaders of progress uh, were persons of exceptional courage and exceptional individual insight, and that only by means of these powerful factors in their own temperaments were they able to endure uh, the perils of leadership. This is not the type of thinking for the average person. He does not wish to be a martyr. He does not wish to be penalized for individuality. Therefore, he finds the simpler way to follow uh, paths of conformity. So what we may term adjustment or integration today is in many instances only conformity. It is the individual accepting what he regards as the lesser of two evils and assuming that it is better to drift with the majority and enjoy the certainties and uncertainties of the majority than to strike out desperately into an individual course for which he is not even prepared. That this situation should develop is a reflection upon our educational theory which is leading us in the general direction of conformity. As it is a conformist function in our society, it does not inspire us to produce individuals capable of standing against trends, motions, and prevailing attitudes. This then brings us to the very heart of our little problem tonight. We're going to integrate. Now how are we going uh, to do this in a manner that accomplishes something of permanent good for ourselves and perhaps a little good for other people. On the ground that most disturbed persons are certainly unadjusted and that in many cases this type of unadjusted state is really a rather private thing that it does not touch all aspects of our social existence then perhaps we have to approach integration on two levels. One is the immediate problem of our personal environment, and the other is the larger problem of our relationship to the total program of human growth. Now it is quite probable that in the solution to many of his problems, man does not require a vast insight into large sociological uh, motions in space. He is more concerned with the immediate adjustment of his own life uh, to the problems which surround him so that he can live in a comparatively relaxed manner. Now relaxation uh, can arise from several different approaches to a problem. One way to become almost completely relaxed is to become intoxicated. Uh, this means that you gradually lose the capacity to worry about anything and you are in the relaxed, happy, jovial state of a pleasantly minded imbecile. <laughs> this situation simply means that you are happy because you do not think. One individual who was noted in the community in a small southern town for his comparatively perfect adjustment, said that the reason why he had this was because he had certain deficiencies in temperament. He was rather ashamed 
of these deficiencies, but he couldn't help them. Help them. He said, for example, I know that there are many times when I should worry, but I just can't keep my mind on it. <laughs> now this uh, delightful state uh, is the primordial uh, infantile state of man. It goes back to his own immediate infancy in which he had no responsibility and depended utterly upon the wisdom of those around him for survival. If he survived, and he probably did, uh, to a measure at least, he uh, was not the product of his own ingenuity, but simply depended upon the currents of life which drifted him gradually uh, toward maturity. The second attitude on this problem of uh, how we can differentiate the happy person is to take the individual who has developed within himself an attitude. This attitude may be wrong or right. It may be solutional or non-solutional. It may be significant or insignificant. But it is an attitude. And this attitude becomes a strong, leading, guiding factor. The individual is adjusted because he is moving in a manner which conforms with his attitude. He has decided how he was going to live. Happiness is his ability to live that way. Unhappiness, interference in this program or project. Thus we do have a considerable number of persons who seemingly are able to go through life with a minimum of psychic stress or tension simply because they have an attitude. This attitude is so dominant that it blots out all uh, evidence contrary to itself. Or it is so uh, completely absorbing that it does not permit the mind to wander into any area of uncertainty. One way, of course, to keep an attitude of this kind in a state of constant efficiency, so that it's really present at all times to support us, is to remain ignorant. By so doing, we never learn anything contrary to the attitude. We do not know how other people think, therefore we do not care. Further than this, what they think does not mean enough to us to cause us to question our own conduct in any particular. This person is nicely adjusted. He is adjusted in the sense that psychic stress will not be his outdoing in any immediate problem. Now the third attitude which can result in adjustment is a more or less strong devotional life. The devotional life is a life clinging to certain invisible truths. Principles or realities affirm to be more important than society. Uh, this individual finds the fullest expression of his life in the continuing service of these principles. Now, he does not uh, exactly parallel the person who simply limits himself by his ignorance. This person may be a comparatively advanced scholar. He may be thoroughly acquainted with the great principles of religion and philosophy. He may have devoted his life uh, to the search for values which are real and enduring. And as he has accumulated this mass of uh, uh, related data, he has gradually elevated his spiritual convictions to a condition or level in which they are beyond all social significance. Society becomes comparatively unimportant. He lives in a world uh, in which he believes that the principles that he holds sacred are universal principles and that if society conforms or does not conform, this is not a primary concern of his. He is not seeking status. He is not seeking to be recognized as a conformist. Rather, he finds his security, his strength, and his integration 
in the fact that he believes that the code which he follows is superior to any social code that can be set up by man. This may lead him to a series of decisions, some of which may be actually antisocial. But he does not care, because he does not regard society as in any way exercising a dominant influence over his life. There are many instances of persons of this kind who have departed from life as we know it, in the daily way of things, have retired as hermits into the wilderness, have joined monastic orders, have renounced possession, and having given up most of the ties which bind the individual to society as we recognize it, no longer regards society as a dominant. He no longer feels that he has to bow to it, adjust to it, accept it, or compromise for it. He has substituted for social adjustment his distinct and determined effort to adjust himself to the will of God or the mysteries of universal and natural law. He has chosen between the laws of man and the laws of God, and has chosen the laws of God. Such a person, however, is seldom a lawbreaker on the level of human laws, because nearly all codes of man's man-made laws are based upon a concept of divine right and justice. Consequently, he is not, as a person, likely to be an illegal uh, member of society. He is simply, uh, as he feels it, superior to and apart from the social integration surrounding him. Now another person who has his part to play in this situation also is the person who believes very sincerely and definitely that the social pattern represents a standard or a challenge to which he must adjust. He regards, for example, the social pattern in this sense. And we have a number of persons of this type. Suppose we have a person who says to himself, the social pattern is a discipline. The social pattern is a way of life which can only be endured by a person who conquers many other elements and pressures in his own personality. Society hands many individuals heavy personal responsibilities. Therefore, to some, the acceptance of these responsibilities becomes the basis of ethics. The individual feels that his acceptance is the measure of his own maturity, that regardless of the weight of the problem, regardless of the personal sacrifice he must make, it is his duty to fulfill certain obligations and responsibilities rising either from his own decisions or from the decisions of his contemporaries. He believes that society depends upon teamwork and that therefore he must play with his team and that this constitutes the only acceptable way of life for him. Remember that this adjustment, like all the others, is due to his own acceptance of what constitutes essential value. If he is accepting value and accepts it with a full heart and a full consciousness, he is not very likely to become neurotic. It is where the acceptance of value becomes not a fulfillment but a burden, not a, a symbol of personal achievement but as a frustration of personal life. It is then that we have trouble. Now we have other pe uh, levels of, and other people attempting to adjust with society. We have the person who by being essentially negative in terms of will, this does not necessarily mean that he is unintelligent. It does not mean that he is uneducated. It simply means that in this person's nature there is no instinct to rebel and there are people of this kind. There is no willfulness 
or determination uh, to resent situations that occur. The person simply is a creature of more or less total acceptances. Whatever comes, that's it. That's what must be done now. The life, therefore, lived in a state of almost complete relaxation to the fact of things, escapes a good many of the tensions and pressures of the rebellious type of mind. This person who does not resent or resist uh, frequently has a comparatively long and often useful life because he wastes no energy either misunderstanding or attempting to understand. Problems are not problems to be analyzed, they are situations to be immediately met. Consequently, this type of person doesn't even ask why the problem comes. He simply sees it and knows that he has it. And from that point on, the only answer seems to be to solve it. This type of person has a good many advantages and also represents a rather interesting psychological type. The main trouble with him is that in his acceptances there is frequently very little censorship. He does not differentiate between his real responsibilities and false responsibilities. He does not differentiate in his own action between that which is helpful to others and that which in one way or another is not helpful. This kind of person takes on someone else's work and does it, never realizing that he is weakening the other person by doing their work. This has led to a concept which has arisen which questions the virtue of patience as to whether it is wise or good in long-range terms of adjustment for the individual to accept without discrimination, without the willingness to try to determine that which is his job and that which is not his job. This, of course, fringes into a number of minor divisions which in one way or another are assuming jobs that are not theirs, sometimes in a simple effort to help, sometimes merely to exercise the pressure for leadership and domination, which often comes when we over-influence the lives of other people. Now this list of possible uh, relationships to society can be considerably extended, but it uh, probably will not be useful to go very much further in this direction, other than to point out that there are many ways in which the individual can react and does react uh, to things happening around him in terms of social integration or adjustment. Psychologically, the question then seems to clarify itself that we have a person under tension. Now tension represents in some way an inharmonious adjustment with something. Our first thought is that it is an inharmonious adjustment with someone else we now begin to realize that it can also be an inharmonious adjustment with ourselves. An individual can be tense all by himself on a desert island. He can be tense trying to live with himself. But this type of symbolism uh, does not particularly intrigue us, and we immediately turn to try to place our tensions on someone else's doorstep. We want someone else to be responsible. But if we have tension, there is something obviously wrong. Now we can take a person who, we will say, becomes um, almost adequately adjusted to the society of his time. Let us say that we resolve to play the game just as everyone else does. That we're going to be a shining example of sheer normalcy normalcy being nothing more or less than a series of compromises of some kind. As has been pointed out before, normal, the normal person, really means the average person. Normalcy is average. To be like everyone else is to be average, or to be like a majority is to be average. 
but this does not mean that the majority is normal. But assuming that we are going to be like other people, is this going to end our tension? Are we going to then be a shining example of perfect adjustment? Well, let's take a case to point. Our neighbors, our friends, our relatives, everybody we know, everyone we admire, has moved out to the north end of the valley and has bought themselves a, a miniature rancho, about 150 feet square, which was sold to them as an estate. They are now 25 or 30 miles from their job, but they are just adjusted. They are like everybody else. So now they fight twice a day on the freeway and become nervous wrecks. Now they are like average. They are average. They're doing what seven or 800,000 other people have done in Los Angeles area. Some have been so ambitious that they commute from San Diego. <laughs> And I suppose in time they will be commuting from Denver and Canada. <laughs> if this becomes the way that most people do it, and you do it, you're average. But what else are you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Furthermore, you will be going back to the psychologist almost immediately because you cannot live with yourself or anyone else. After you reach the point where you begin to talk to yourself in the car, addressing your remarks, of course, to the driver in front who can't hear you, there may be some doubt as to your integration. But this is average. There are many other equally peculiar things that average people do. And if we do them, we shall be average and equally peculiar. Now, some of these things do not mean much. We can be a little foolish and probably survive. But if we simply conform, does this mean that we are going to be healthy? I've been reading some statistics lately that look a little bit astonishing. We've been talking so much about uh, various degrees of tension and so forth among the American people, and I've often reported what I had heard, namely that nearly 50% of our people are known to be to some degree neurotic. The latest figure is that there are only 15% of our people who are not. <laughs> We're climbing rapidly. Now if the 85% of our people are now neurotic, to what is the individual going to adjust in order to be normal? Is he going to adjust to the average, which will mean that he must be neurotic? Or is he going to stand with that 15% that may fade away while he stands with them? <laughs> what is the answer as to how he shall estimate his own, uh, we'll say, adequate adjustment? It becomes more and more evident that he cannot adjust with prevailing policy and survive. He cannot adjust with the trends that are now dominating public thinking, because these trends are not essentially sound. The persons who are now thinking that way are miserable and are rapidly passing from a misery uh, to a malady. And those who attempt to follow in their footsteps will do the same. We are fad ridden. We are loaded with false values and false valuations. Uh, we have completely lost uh, the sense of value and are really competing ourselves into an early grade. Can we adjust with this? I doubt very much if we can. It's in the same problem as with a family. How is a person going to adjust his own life to an impossible relative? The relative has no intentions of adjusting to anything. The relative will not go and seek help or be willing to admit they need counseling 
The relative is going to continue to do exactly as they please. So we go to council. We try everything we can do to figure some way to adjust ourselves to this mysterious malady in our family. How long and how much adjustment is necessary to enable an average person to live with an impossible one? That is the question. Now, how are we going to work out this adjustment, assuming that we will not get a 50-50 situation? Well, we have several uh, ways of looking at it. Some say we should live with it. Some say we should live above it. Some say we should live around it. And others say we should walk out. Now, all of these have their advantages and their disadvantages. But in the ordinary sense of the word, the person who must accommodate his own way of life to a situation that is itself basically unfair, this person must suffer in some way, regardless of the nobility of his mind, or his generosity, or his patience, or his effort at understanding. Nobody can enjoy and relax in the continual presence of injustice. This is a social situation. It doesn't make any difference whether this injustice is a member of our own family or an unjust law among nations. To adjust to injustice can only be accomplished by some form of tremendous personal sacrifice. It may mean that the person has recourse to practically every resource that he possesses. He may take refuge in his religion, as one said not long ago, quietly winning the martyr's crown. They're going to have some jewels in it when they get somewhere else. <laughs> but polishing a future crown does not necessarily make the present life endurable, nor reasonable. The individual who is moved by a certain faith to accept the injustices of others without complaint will also become neurotic whether they admit it or not. And in this situation there will be more trouble. Also, the situation never being really cured because one person gives and the other person takes will perhaps result in serious trouble for children, will destroy many of the values of life, and interfere with the individual growth of everyone concerned. Something's wrong. How do we adjust to it? What are the standards by which we are going to try to make ourselves an acceptable member of our society? Certain common, ordinary adjustments we can all make without too much trouble. But as, as these adjustments become more complicated and deeper and more meaningful, we have to pause and consider. Because we cannot live with a situation that insults our intelligence or, in one way or another, in offends our integrity. These things we just can't do satisfactorily over a long period of time. So the next question arises, how is the person going to meet what might well be termed a some form of integration or achieve it which does not insult his intelligence or offend his conscience or demand some unreasonable compromise of his principles. The answer seems to be to all of this that psychology of integration has mostly to do with the relation of the person to himself. Now, psychology isn't willing to admit this entirely, but is beginning to move pretty definitely in the direction of recognizing that there has to be some way, some universal ethics, by means of which an individual is not required by circumstances to offend his own conscience. Because this offense against conscience is a 
a certain cause of mental emotional sickness. If we are then to adjust to something, to what must we adjust? And the answer in this situation seems inevitable, namely, that we have to adjust to the core of our own internal conviction. That the normal person is actually the individual who is leading an enlightened life from within himself. That this is normal as by way of a, almost a facetious remark, we must say the individual must be normal if he is the only one left. Uh, that in this case, normalcy is a relationship with himself and not a relationship with society. Normalcy and integration are therefore the individual moving as a coordinated unit in which all the parts of himself are working together. In order, therefore, to be normal, by this meaning, able to be moved from within self adequately, the answer must be that the self must become an adequate leader. And here's where our big problem is today. We are trying to adjust people to themselves and each other without taking into consideration the fact that somewhere inside of these adjusting beings there has to be an adequate personal integrity. And this integrity has to arise from an inward comprehension of values. If we are going to depend upon ourselves for our directives, then these directives must come. And a person who is profoundly ignorant of every essential value has not these directives. His, his dependence upon social adjustment is therefore in a measure related to his lack of individual a power or ability to make decision and to sustain his own code according to his own conscience. Therefore, we must admit that the ignorant man or the man lacking internal directive must continue to be unadjusted. The only hope he can have is to be average and to suffer from the more common and familiar ailments rather than unique ones of his own devisement. If he is average, he will live as average people live, die from the problems that kill average people, weep when average people weep, and laugh when average people uh, do so at the broad suggestions of their favorite comedians. This problem of averageness is the refuge of the person who does not have very much internal directive. Now, you can't have this internal directive unless you develop it. And the only forms of internal directive that we know at the present time that are adequate are the creative powers of religion, philosophy, and art. These are the most direct uh, dynamics of value. These directives uh, work upon the person from within himself, giving him career, giving him purpose for his own existence, giving him incentive, and at the same time providing him with the skills necessary to do the things that he believes to be most worth doing. Also as his concepts of what uh, worthwhile things in, uh, develop, he becomes more and more willing to voluntarily sacrifice the unimportant to the, uh, to the important, the uh, insignificant to the significant. He therefore determines for himself what he will give up in order to attain something else. And because he arrives at the decision of adjustment in this way himself, he is without conflict. Thus, the answer to integration means that there is only one level upon which people can actually constructively unite, and that is on the level of their own fullest experience of maturity. 
we may say that the bodies of creatures uh, may come into proximity, but that only unities of consciousness can result in a powerful identity, or we might say an integration. The only thing that can integrate us are the noblest sentiments and thoughts of our lives, for in these we do come nearer and nearer together. And when we talk to two persons, both of whom have led devoted and dedicated lives uh, seeking to advance the public good, when we talk to two such persons, we find that they have much in common that they understand each other because they have experienced the same incentives and the same psychic directives. But when we talk to very selfish people or persons without these creative pressures within themselves, there is very little understanding because those who are without internal light are entirely intolerant of each other. Consequently, if we want to integrate we must unite upon the highest patterns which we are capable of devising. We must unite in creativity and in construction, not in the indifferent policies of compromise which can never lead to any strong bond of enduring sympathy or understanding. Then let us summarize this phase of our problem something in this way that for the individual who wishes to survive the pressures of his times, integration is the union within himself of the various elements of his own life and purpose. And the dedication of this unity of achievement to the fulfillment of some reasonable and proper end. This person then does not have to be adjusted because he is an individual. On the other hand, he is not antisocial. And the antisocial person is simply one who is uncomfortable in society. Uh, the person whose directives are clear is comfortable in society, regardless of where he is, because he is a self-directing being. Let's try to clarify that point a little more. Uh, integration is to a measure a matter of insight. Insight is the ability of people to understand not only themselves but each other. Understanding or true insight is one of the most powerful instruments uh, to relax tension. Insight is our ability to estimate the facts of things and not to become over-opinionated or the victims of opinion. Do it and see their own grown children growing again around them and everything is uh, very rosy and pleasant. But they have never expected the child to be more than it is. Of course, it is a little peculiar and unique and wonderful because it is their grandchild. But that is the, about the extent of it. Now, when we go out with people who are grown up physically, and they go babbling along like five-year-old children, we say, oh, I can't waste my time with people like this. Therefore, we begin to get more and more miserable as the hours go by. Then one of these individuals comes up with a tremendous idea that they would like an evening of bridge, and the scholar departs in a state of profound misery, or sits in a corner and pouts. Now, this represents simply lack of insight. It is a very definite fact uh, that reasonable people, intelligent people, do not expect to be continually in the presence of great and important occasions. Really thoughtful persons uh, can quietly accept what they know other people to be just as we know what children are going to be. But because we are short-sighted, we think that these people have to be grown up because they're 40 or 50 years old. This has nothing to do with it. 
just as the same situation is that these people may be saying, I don't see why this other person has to be so magnificently aloof and superior because he's only the same age as we are. Uh, the different points of view. But actually, the person with insight, knowing the kind of world he lives in, doesn't expect another kind of world. If he insists on having another kind of world, he can perhaps take advantage of interplanetary travel a little later. <laughs> but he's here. He knows in his heart the kind of world he lives in, but he resents it every time he meets it. This is not, not good. If we do not expect too much, we may be pleasantly surprised occasionally. But if we expect the unreasonable, we will be perpetually disappointed. Therefore, there are wonderful privileges in this life simply to relax, to enjoy a situation without feeling that every occasion in life must have monumental significance. Perhaps what we need most is a good sleep, and perhaps we can get that socially. I have a friend who was a genius at sleeping with his eyes wide open, <laughs> and he had a most intelligent expression on his face. This was sheer genius. Very often, we go out to share some minor or light social experience, and we are under such tension when we leave to join this experience that we require either alcohol or something else to let us down, or else we expect the evening to be the same tempo of continual pressure. And if it isn't, we fall apart. There is a real genius in being able to simply relax where the situation permits. We have also great skill in realizing that we can all learn much more by keeping our mouths shut than any other way. Sometimes it's very difficult to spend a quiet evening while some bore is telling what he thinks. But if we open our mouths, someone else will say there are two bores telling what they think. If we are quiet and use our analytical faculties, we may learn a great deal from the most stupid remarks. We may also enrich and enlarge our understanding of people and of human nature. And there's this blessed and wonderful situation that when someone else is talking, we do not have to. And usually we're a great success if we don't. I know people come in the office once in a while to discuss their problem. And they talk for an hour. Never a chance do I get to put a single word in. <laughs> At the end of the hour, they jump up, pump my hand enthusiastically, and said, I, you'll never know how much you've helped me. <laughs> so sometimes we also serve by keeping quiet. We also can gain a great deal of poise and relaxation, and if it becomes too difficult, we can retire into a quiet meditation until the fracas is over. There is no need to become involved in these things. There is no need to live in a state of tension due to being insulted by somebody else's lack of intelligence. There is no need for any of these pressures. They are simply pressures, usually, of a person who is so anxious to correct somebody else's mistakes that he has no chance to find his own faults and do anything about them. So relax. This means that insight will help us continually to relax. This does not mean that we accept what is not true. But we realize that there is no value in being like Don Quixote and simply lancing windmills. The problem is to discover who we can help, when and how. And for the rest of the time, keep a vigilant watch upon the things that happen in order that we may learn as much as we can from them and be distracted as little as possible by them. So that if we quiet out these problems, smooth them down, we will find that a great deal of our uh, uh, lack of relaxation is simply due to the fact that we fight back at things 
when a victory means nothing in the first place, because nothing is going to be won uh, when we try to reason with an unreasonable person or support a cause which the other person is not even interested in considering. This, you, this quiets things down. Therefore, we can say that integration to a measure is a continual state of relaxed poise. It isn't an artificial thing. It isn't something that we simply put off. It's the fact that we can live comfortably in the presence of things we don't always agree with or in situations which perhaps we would not want to have as a permanent fixture. But just as we adjust without question to weather and climate, knowing that we can do nothing about these things, so the temperaments of people in a social structure are like weather and climate. We either accept them or we don't accept them. And if we fight against them, we simply create more and more tension. It is perfectly possible, therefore, to use the things that happen to encourage our own integration so that we can finally come to a comparatively happy situation. Uh, the critic works a lot of tension on himself because he is criticizing his own society. He is criticizing the environment in which he exists. The skeptic loses all the strength that comes uh, from the growth of certainties within himself. Uh, the cynic loses all of the goodness or the warmth of life by trying to see something wrong in everything. Instead of assuming that everything is wrong, the simplest thing to assume is the correct thing, that each thing is what it is. That underneath the surface of life, there are these patterns that forbid any person from acting inconsistent with the dominating pressure of his own temperament. Therefore, if he has a certain kind of temperament, we either like it or we do not like it. If we like it, we renew or continue an association of friendship. If we do not like it, there is nothing to hold those people together. And where this situation arises, there is no way of forcing an agreement where it is not voluntary. So a little by little, facts take away the sting of things. Because facts have, there is no reason why facts should ever offend us. The only reason that a fact can offend us is the fact that we are not strong enough to stand the fact. We should never be hurt by truth. We should never be hurt by realities. If we are hurt by realities, then we are not big enough to accept them. The realities are not wrong, but we have a wrong attitude toward them. So whatever is that must be as it is, and we must associate with it in as easy and pleasant and relaxed a manner as possible. Now, it usually happens that any person who has any real consciousness in his own nature, wandering around through society, develops opportunities in which he can be helpful. This is a more or less satisfying state of affairs. We are usually more self-forgetting, which is very important, when we have our minds upon trying to do some good to someone or something. So as we go along, there are opportunities in which we can use what we know, where we are actually sought out and asked for our assistance and our judgment. This is especially true if we are living rather well. If our own achievements show that we have attained a certain measure of integration, other people certainly want to know how we do it. Thus we develop outlets, constructive ways of sharing information. But it's very hard to get interested in the advice given by a person who is making a miserable failure out of his own life. Thus, if we are not sought after, for the advice that we believe we could give, then there may be some inconsistency in our temperaments that needs working over. It certainly would be worth a second look on general principles.
it's usually there. Now, the uh, development then of usefulness, of value to other people, gets our minds off of what's wrong with them in a negative sense and into the channel of what we can do to help them. This is a, very often a constructive and valuable approach to society. Also in general, we would like to advance society in some way. Almost every thoughtful person has seen things that need changing. And if the dedication is strong enough and the consecration is deep enough, probably something can be changed for the better. But here, of course, uh, we restrict human achievement to a comparatively small group of dynamic people who seemingly are able to cause change. The majority just can't stay with it long enough. They get tired, they get bored, they get disillusioned, and they get psychotic. So continuity is necessary for the achievement of a lasting good. The person must stay with it. He must plan it, he must build his own character to sustain it, and he must gradually gain knowledge of that which is necessary for the end which he seeks to attain. Lack of integration frequently arises, therefore, from lack of knowledge in some department of life. The person is not adequate. He is not a success in business or just is barely getting by. He has very little security uh, arising from his inner sense of knowing exactly what he is doing. Uncertainty and fear and this type of thing also will prevent integration, will prevent the person mingling with, mingling with and meeting with other people on a proper basis. I have observed that many people are more interesting than you suspect. That's another problem of integration, in, in my estimation, is that we are often over hasty in deciding whether or not uh, we wish to uh, achieve any kind of balanced relationship with another person. One of the things that makes integration move is that it is interesting. Interesting things bring people together. Boresome things separate them. Interesting people draw people. Bores do not. The person whose life is interesting, therefore, is sought out and becomes a positive center. It isn't necessary for this person to continually flow in the direction of others. They flow toward him because of the interesting things that he is doing or the interesting ways in which he does them. If you have any interest in life, you will find that it will draw people. It will also uh, give you outlets uh, which are not neurotic. Many persons have a great loneliness and isolation due to the lack of essentially valuable companionship. And a lot of bad adjustment is just lack of friends, lack of people who take a little interest in us so that we can take a little interest in them. I know that a number of persons who uh, have discussed this problem, and some rather interesting people, have pointed out that so many individuals are just as afraid as we are to open an unfamiliar subject. They're afraid if they start talking about something that's just a little unusual that you will be offended or that you will regard them as foolish or compare them to the gentle imbecile we mentioned earlier. Therefore, they keep their whole life and their attitudes and their words and their thoughts on such a commonplace level because they feel that this is the only way to make sure that no one dislikes them. It ends up by no one liking them either because nobody really rejoices in dullness 
perhaps except the dull person. He seems to have a wonderful time, but other people do not enjoy it. Therefore, there are ways in which very often you can open a situation. If, for instance, in your home or wherever you happen to uh, run across a situation, you either have something of symbolic significance by which another person can know how to reach you. It can often make a tremendous bridge between people who have otherwise so little to form a, an opening wedge of contact. No one wants to make a mistake in these things. You may have been studying reincarnation all your life, but you go to some stranger's home who apparently has no interest in the subject, and you hesitate, quite properly, from beginning a long and earnest discourse on the subject. You say to yourself, I wonder if he's a Seventh-day Adventist. I wonder if he's a Mormon or an atheist. What is it? Is he going to think I'm crazy? And on the danger of that particular situation, we are very reticent. But if this person are somewhere around where you can see it, some object, something which indicates that their mind might be of the same interest as your own. This is a hook you can take hold of. I know of several cases where this has actually worked. In a home of a person who is not at all uh, generally regarded as interested in any deep subject, just a rather... Uh, status-seeking individual, as far as everyone else knew, one, you know, trying to adjust uh, to everybody's point of view, which is a very hard job and rather rewardless. Uh, I happen to notice a very beautiful Siamese painting, small, but evidently chosen with great care, and great thoughtfulness, it was a nice thing. And in a very few moments, we had a subject in common, Siamese art. And it wasn't long before I began to find out what the man really thought. And it was entirely different from the thing that his bridge-playing associates ever heard of. But it was there, but if he hadn't left a little symbol somewhere, you might have known him for ten years and never a thought of trying to talk to him about Siamese art. And he would never have brought it up because he wouldn't assume you were interested. So these doors and barriers are often just plain blanks. There are very dull people in this world, but not as many of them as many people think. The dull person is a retiring, reticent person who perhaps has been offended or hurt, who just decides to keep quiet study quietly when there's no one else around, and as one person I did, I know did, lock all the books in the bottom of a trunk every night. You just didn't want to be caught with them for fear they'd be hurt some more. Not the books, the individual. But when this person found out that someone else was interested, it opened up immediately. And in this definite desire to be normal, Many people lock out and lock up their own interests. They're just afraid to be regarded as eccentric. Now, you might not think this is much more than brutal cowardice, but it really is a little more serious and tragic even than that. These people, particularly if they are breadwinners, if they're working in some conservative industry, if they're working for some hard-headed employer, one breath, of nonconformity, and their futures would be seriously hazarded. So they're afraid. They are afraid that they will lose their, their survival means. And to protect this, they have tried to become normal by utter and complete conformity. There are millions of people with this situation locked up in them in this country. They're just afraid, just as afraid as they would be to go to work in a sports shirt. Everything demands conformity. And this type of thing is very hard on a person who perhaps is a little lonely and is a little serious and never has a chance to express it. So it's interesting sometimes in trying to uh, change your, perhaps your 
belief about how foolish most people are uh, to watch for symbols of some interest and also to make sure that somewhere in your way of life there are a few symbols that other people can sense or see or discover and which will open them up or will make them suspect that you will not ridicule their thinking. On this pattern you'll be surprised of how many doors opened and how much more valuable our friends suddenly become. There are actual cases in which people have been students of uh, philosophy for half a lifetime and most of the members of their own family never knew it. They have done everything so secretly to avoid criticism because perhaps the marriage partner was opposed, that there was no real uh, sympathy in these lives. And this person struggling on to try to be a better person, try to do something worthwhile, was just simply forced to labor in the darkness of the uttermost secrecy and almost conspiracy to, to nourish the needs of their own inner lives. If you can break through a lot of these things, you'd be surprised what you find sometimes. And of course, there is a world of common sense, of just old-fashioned, good, real, practical thinking under the surface of many people's lives, but they just do not dare to express it or have no reason to do so. In attempting to integrate, therefore, take into consideration a little more thorough thought about what you're integrating with. Make sure that you really understand this world, that you are not merely playing as others play, that it's a game of masks with everybody presenting a false face, no one daring to show their own features. And if we can uh, get through this situation, we will discover perhaps not normalcy, but we will discover that the average isn't always just what it seems to be. That there are many things in life that are far more interesting than we are even willing to admit that they are. Because we finally build an attitude that nothing is worthwhile and everybody's rather foolish, and then we settle down and nurse our own disillusionments. Now, these things do not lead to integration either. Now, how should we tell primarily if a person is integrated? Let's assume that we have some kind of a rule by which we could say this person has adjusted themselves. Well, obviously, the first evidence of true integration is that the person is in control of his own actions and his own thoughts. The integrated person is able to relax and is therefore able to meet problem with organization rather than tension. A really integrated person has only rare interludes of tension. We cannot say that anyone can be completely without any tension. This is almost more than we can assume of a nervous system that is as subtly integrated as man's nervous system happens to be. Therefore, we must assume that once in a while we'll be impatient. Occasionally we will worry and maybe once or twice in a long while uh, we will allow a critical or negative word that we don't really want to say to slip out. These things will happen. I, uh, but the integrated person is one in which these lapses away from organization are rare. And uh, the one who is not integrated is the one in which any kind of a proper attitude is rare. <laughs> Uh, the integrated person, therefore, is not wasting energy. He is not wasting the life within him. Nor is he moving against obstacles that are so obviously beyond his control and his ability that he can only pound his head against them. It is important for people to know what they can do. Make sure that they're doing it. And also, perhaps, to realize that there are certain things that is not likely they will be able to do for a long time to come. And against these things, take a proper attitude and not simply uh, rush in and force unpleasant situations where you cannot control the results. 
So integration simply means a measure of ourselves, an integrating of our resources, the ability to meet problems with poise, and the ability to use the best and all of our faculties at any time that the need arises, without prejudice and opinion and the deceit of ourselves. It is the ability to be free from trying to confuse our own minds. Hiding behind opinion or prejudice or intolerance is simply a statement of defeat. It means that we can't solve a thing, so all we can do is hurt it. Thus, uh, integration is kindly, is just, and represents a recognition of value. We come back now to the person we mentioned earlier, who has certain religious light or leading by means of which he is able to face problems. Uh, the person who has understood his own psyche adequately, has this kind of leadership in himself. For one thing, he knows that on many occasions he can trust himself. This is a far more vital discovery than to discover that we cannot trust someone else. We cannot always depend upon our own attitudes. We cannot think that a thought is important just because we think it any more than we can say a child is truly bright just because it is our child. We might hope it is. We can develop a glamour that will justify our thinking so. But this doesn't make it true to anyone but ourselves. So if we do not overestimate the importance of our own attitudes, where these attitudes are obviously untrained, we also escape pressures. I've known several instances in which serious psychological difficulties came simply to a person who was bluffing. Now, we all bluff a little. Uh, we all uh, like to feel that we can uh, convince other people of our abilities, whether we have them or not. And I know people who have used bluffing to exaggerate the authority of their opinions world without end. But a bluff is a dangerous thing. A bluff creates tension. Because the, one, the moment we try to assume something, we are not. We, have a, we are thrown onto a highly defensive position. I know a man who uh, got employment in one of our large airplane factories. Actually, he was not qualified for the job. But he bluffed. They asked him if he had certain experience in architectural engineering. He said, yes. He'd never had a day of experience in it. But he was a rather clever chap. So as soon as he landed the job, he watched the people around him who were in the same job. He was part of a battery of engineers. Uh, he, uh, in one way or another, inveigled a little information out of one or a little insight out of another. He worked it around so that for several months... He was able to keep the job, and no one for a moment suspected that he had had no training. The crisis came when, after about a year's employment, they wanted to promote him in the department. <laughs> now, he'd been living day by day, expecting to be thrown out. The, uh, the idea of promotion was the final blow. He couldn't stand any more of it. So he retired. He resigned the job. He was never caught. But the pressure built up. And if he had stayed even in the job another six months, he probably would have had a nervous breakdown. The fear, which was almost a guilt. The sensing that he was never quite adequate. The recognition that any moment someone who really knew would come along and ask him the question that he couldn't answer. That someone would check his record and find out that he was untrained. These things hung over his head like the sword of Damocles. And he was gradually going into a serious neurosis, simply trying to bluff. Now, many people, to some degree, do the same thing, perhaps not to this extent. But wherever we try to be what we are not, claim virtues we do not practice, claim knowledge we don't possess, we are constantly on the defensive. And this is another way to destroy our own psychic integration. 
If in the course of a reasonable amount of study, we can begin to get our values straight, if we can spend a certain amount of time in contemplative exercise. Now, contemplative exercise does not mean hatha yoga. Contemplative exercise simply means uh, the building of the abstract patterns of life, the archetypes upon which we must depend for motivation. If we enrich ourselves culturally, if we give a certain amount of serious attention to forms of knowledge which contribute to our internal peace of mind and the organizing of our psychic resources, if we gradually develop a better philosophy of life, if we turn to one or two good sources of instruction and benefit from this instruction, not because we accept everything we are told, but because we gradually reach a sense of internal adequacy. We have at least working answers. At least we have reasonable reasons for what we think and do. And these develop little by little until they become also guides to the next things that we do. If we, for instance, we can gradually put a universe of law and order together in our own consciousness, we can get rid of the ideas of miracles and of accidents and of coincidences and begin to see the, the, the dimensions of a merit system arising in space around us. If we gradually put the universe into an ethical relationship to living things, little by little, we begin to mature a sense of honesty, of, of integrity in our own lives. So through the enrichment of our culture, through the study of great basic thoughts, and through appreciation for the true creativity that has given us what is good in our world, we slowly develop a strong inner life. An inner life that we don't have to constantly uh, fall back upon in the sense of running away and hiding in it, but an inner life that is placid, that uh, has a, a fairly adequate answer in itself for the common questions of the day. We don't have to wonder all the time. Some of this wondering we can put in order immediately. We do not have to be catered to. We don't demand it any longer. We don't have to be agreed with. It doesn't mean anything. Little by little, our philosophy of life makes foolish things seem just as foolish as they are and makes wise things reveal their own wisdom clearly and obviously and honestly. So we get away from pretenses. We don't admire it. We no longer need it. When we do not need falsehood, we won't be problemed or plagued with its consequences. So integration, it seems to me, the even integration socially means a person who gradually reaches a state of poise. A poised person is one who is sufficient to his needs, who moves through society in a gentle, strong manner, uh, self-contained in the sense that he has no dependency upon the whims of others, but not aloof in the sense of being uninterested in others not sophisticated in any sense of the word, but be bestowing a certain sense of ease because situations do not fluster or upset him. He is su sufficient for them. He can win or lose an argument or a discussion with the perfect happiness of spirit. He doesn't have to win. He is not fighting to win. He is simply fighting to be himself, to be a true person, regardless of whether he wins or not. So we have poised people. Uh, and we get to this situation, it's interesting that society reacts. Uh, one of the most uh, interesting phases of integration is what it does in preventing others from imposing upon us. The person who is integrated 
is given a strange but subtle kind of respect. There is a certain recognition. When a person comes into an, as an association or an assembly of people who is obviously always going to be equal to the emergency, whose graciousness, whose poise, whose natural but not assumed dignities are such that he wins respect, he will not be treated cheaply. He will not be imposed upon and he will not be the victim of the conspiracies of others. Thus the integrated person has a certain wall around himself, a wall through which every good and kindly thing can pass through a thousand doorways, but a wall which will not encourage other persons to impose upon him. We impose upon people we think we can deceive. If we sense that we cannot deceive this person, we will not try. Or if we do try, we will go very short distance before we are discouraged. If we know that this person is not going to be angry, we don't try to anger him. If we know that he won't argue, we don't argue with him. If we know that he is not going to be intolerant or support any prejudice that is unreasonable, we're not going to plague him with them. Because when we try to sell a falsehood to someone else, we need a buyer. And if the other person is not a buyer and we know it, we will not bother with the sales talk. So when we sense intelligence, we do not impose upon it for the most part. The person is certainly protected against a large part of imposition. If we know a person is going to say yes or no and mean it, we will only ask such questions as we hope will receive a favorable answer. We are not going to impose because we know we cannot. Yet at the same time, this person may be entirely gracious and willing to render all reasonable assistance at any time. Thus, the person who is integrated does radiate an atmosphere. The person who has adjusted adequately to life is recognized as such. People who have no idea what adjustment is will realize that this person has it, whatever it is. Individuals in every walk of life will therefore refrain from involving such a person in a situation that is unfortunate or embarrassing because they know it is useless. No one will try to sell him um, phony oil stock because they know he won't buy. They know he isn't foolish, therefore they won't try to over-influence him. They won't expect him to conform with fo foolishness because they know he isn't foolish. They don't expect him to wear outlandish clothes. They don't expect him to be a status seeker because they already know that he's a real person. And this in its own turn brings a relationship with other people that is far more comforting than the brittle efforts that we so often make. So integration within ourselves certainly does create better relations with everyone around. The only problem that most people suffer from is that they learn to integrate too late. They do not achieve it until too many problems have gone beyond ordinary correction. If we have been an easy mark for 50 years, it's difficult to change in our gray hairs. If we have followed or if we have supported imposition for a half a lifetime and then suddenly we refuse to any longer, there is a major crisis in our affairs. Actually, from our schooling years on, we should be taught the clear, direct acceptance of real responsibility and the unwillingness to accept imposition at any time for any reason. If we could start out earlier in life with these realizations, we would have many clear and relaxed hours that are now spent walking the floor, trying to extricate ourselves from a series of previous compromises we should never have gotten into. 
So integration cannot start too soon. Whenever it appears, we need it. And we need it as fast as we can get it. Uh, to our way of thinking, philosophy leads as an integrating power. We think of Plato as an integrated human being. We think of Socrates as what? Socrates was not a conformist, but he was a person whose nonconformity we respect because we know that it arose from great insight and from a tremendous unselfishness that was far more real and more wonderful than any of the little minor offenses that he may have committed in the name of common sense. We know the dignity and majesty of Plato's mind. We realize the graciousness of it. We know that we can't all be Plato's. But we do also recognize the fact that we can also strengthen or deepen a philosophy of life that it will help us to keep this poise, to keep this rightness of things. For the moment we begin to impose our own rightness upon life, the moment we move serenely and rightly in the pattern of our own existence, we become an important constructive factor in the environment of other people. Then we are contributing to a normal world. We are giving other people who are also seeking bridges something to be considered normal. Our better conduct can also become within the pattern of someone else's adjustment to normalcy. Uh, the real normal uh, individuals of history are those who have not just conformed because it is not normal for man to conform only. Man is a creating being. Man is a thinking being. He is a reasoning, inventing being. Conformity is simply acceptance of defeat. On the other hand, violent nonconformity is a dangerous thing for the average person. But to outgrow conformity without violating it, to gradually rise to an individuality that becomes more significant than conformity, this can be done. And the person who has his little economic problem trying to think it through may also find that he can be a more interesting person so that he is accepted now because he is a thinker rather than the fact that he was accepted before because he agreed with someone else. Uh, people like to be agreed with, but in these days of intense competition, these same people prefer to employ someone who has ideas. And the person who has great ideas usually will survive even in an economic pressure. I was talking to a man not long ago who has a very large agency dealing with creative problems, ideas, and business. And he said, you know, for many years I took the attitude that I knew what was best. And when a man said to me, you're wrong, I fired him. In the last few years I've made a discovery. Now when a man says to me, you're wrong, I say to him, all right, prove it and I'll double your salary. But you've got to prove it. Because he said, I've found the men who said I was right never contributed anything. I had to do all the work. All they could do was agree with me. That I learned the importance of hiring people who dared to think for themselves. Now this means that for this man, the idea of a normal employee has changed. A few years ago, the normal employee was a yes man. Today, he is a man who is able to compromise and say, maybe. Tomorrow, he may be a man who comes straight out and says, no. These problems are changing with the pressure of our time. But unfortunately, we're not producing many people to meet the changes. We are still educating millions of yes men. We are only able to produce occasional individuals who have the internal capacity for personal decision. Thus, normalcy would seem to me to imply uh, not the average, 
but that which is naturally to be expected of man. Man has been given a brain. It should be normal for him to use it. He has been given creativity. It would be normal for him to exhibit it. He has been endowed by nature with common sense. It would be normal for him to show it. And it is also true that he has been given an individuality. And while in the higher measures of philosophy this may be a subject of some dispute, on the practical level of living, the individual is interesting, important, and really ingratiating because he is an individual. And the person who can't stand another individual is badly adjusted. If he can stand another individual, he is already on his way to respecting the power of each person in this world to make a unique contribution to life. So I would say that the normal person is the person who makes creative contribution. But the normal person is the one who lives as best he can regardless of circumstances, whereas the average person lives by compromise. On this basis, I believe that social adjustment is essentially attained by a person who learns to know more about society than other people know, who understands better the pattern, the purpose, the reason underlying the social relationships of living things, and through greater understanding is able to steer a wiser course. This person, I think, is normal. And I think it is something that has happened within the last century particularly uh, that we have paralyzed those very initiatives by which we are normal and have made a virtue out of agreeing with the lower two-thirds of society as far as its levels of errors are concerned and being afraid to join that very small group that has always had to do the thinking. But for man, this is not normal. It would not be normal for a five-year-old child uh, to dissertate on logic. It is not normal for a 40-year-old man or woman to simply conform with everybody else. Normalcy for the adult is that it be a self-creating, self-unfolding uh, being, a person. And with this personal power developed and matured to be a reasonable, interesting, happy, adjusted, relaxed person, able to face whatever happens in life with a reasonable degree of fortitude and acceptance because he is wise enough to understand the reasons behind life and the laws governing human conduct. This is the person who my think is normal. And this person not only will be able to make a social adjustment, he can adjust the society, but more than this, whether he realizes it or not, society will make a real and desperate effort to adjust with him. Because society instinctively admires the person who is right and has the courage to do what he knows is right. The only persons who will not admire him are lazy people. They won't admire anything. But the normal person of this type sets an example of normalcy, which I think we desperately need in our world at this time. Well, I guess that's it.